Thank you. Welcome to this very special episode of your team number, the Amazing Race Recaps from Reality TV Warriors. My name is Michael Armstrong, and joining me as always is the Canadian who spent years blaming his shortcomings on the budget of this podcast, Logan Saunders. Good afternoon. And given we're legally mandated now to feature an Australian on every Amazing Race podcast, also joining us is our special guest, best friend of the podcast, or at least just below Gilles de Costa, I would say, the author of the upcoming erotic novel Flashbang in the Oubliettes, someone who's been described as Bo Ryan's favourite person in the whole entire world, apart from his mistresses, David Bindley. Just below Gilles de Costa is what I do best. <laughs> I wasn't even setting you up for that one either, which is even better. It was just going to be a solid friend of the podcast, and then best friend of the podcast just came out because I'm already in mole mode. <laughs> it's better than this season. <laughs> yeah, it's not hard when you consider we're recording this on Sunday, and literally a week from today, me and Logan will probably be recording the Vidin premiere. It's a week away, even though it's next year, technically. Good luck. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. <laughs> And I don't think there is anyone in the fan community better qualified than Bindles to really join us, given, let's be honest, outside of the people who actually do the podcast normally with us, you've probably contributed most of the podcast. That wouldn't be hard. I've probably contributed more than Michelle at this point. True. Most of the time, Michelle is distracted by spraying her children with a hose <laughs> to keep them away from her. Well, you know, got to keep the Ubliette clean somehow. Spraying her kids with Agent Orange. As my brother joked um, right before we started recording this podcast, Christmas is a special time in the Pierce Tenement house because that's when she sprays water at them rather than the septic tank. It's like trying to get a cat off of furniture. Exactly. She just has a spray bottle like, get away, you little shits. <laughs> just put a laser in their eyes, they'll move. I do love how my Australian accent over these podcasts has kind of slowly drifted away from something that is actually decently Australian, thanks to the Chris Lilly shows, to just a generic Bogan accent for Michelle, even though she's had nothing like it, at least on the podcast. There's two Australian accents. There's the Hemsworth and there's Michelle. There's the, that's the only two things. There is no in between. No. So what would you say your credentials are to be able to judge how, let's be honest, shite Amazing Race 32 was, Bindles? Uh, wrote a detailed list to every challenge guide ever. Not just for Amazing Race, by the way. That's for every show, literally every yeah. every show. Amazing Race, Mole, Survivor. We're talking, you know, 100,000 words each. Spent so much time tweeting about how racist Amazing Race Australia was that the show's Twitter account blocked me, and somehow the host ended up sliding into my DMs, which, you know... I'd forgotten the official account blocked you, actually. <laughs> yeah, no. They blocked me, and then Bo Ryan slid into my DMs, and I'm like, I'm leaving you on red because this is just going to lead to a dick pic. But, you know, every photo of Bo Ryan is a dick pic. That is usually how it works with Bo Ryan. If he slides into DMs, you just have to assume there is going to be a dick pic coming. Yeah. But nothing but love, brother. Nothing but love. No. Bindles on the podcast has contributed pretty much every Rachel's job list going. It's... It's probably my favourite running joke from the past two years is the ridiculousness of you just trying to put me off whenever uh, whenever we have those lists. Oh, thank you so much. As well as doing a fuckload of research when I can't be asked, you just DMing me going, yeah, you know that this is super wrong, right? Yeah, no, I don't even research. I just, you know, think of it. It's quite a contribution. So Bindles is pretty much an honorary honorary podcast anyway, even before the fact that he bought a fucking mic just for this, kind of point out. And, you know, he's pretty well qualified to talk about where Amazing Race 32 went wrong and where Amazing Race has been going wrong. Awesome! And, you know, Logan wrote a blog that was pretty much this entire podcast, so this is going to be great. I'm just going to be reading Logan's <laughs> yes. blog. I don't even have to read my own stuff, just to have somebody else read what I said so I don't have to say anything this whole time. Yeah, Logan's just here as a formality. It's brilliant. Yeah, yeah. I can just play Fire Emblem uh while while you guys talk so essentially we're going to be answering three questions on this podcast which is where did amazing race 32 go wrong where did it start going wrong and what can production do to change it other than actually listening to us the people who've seen the show or how to do season 33 which is get everyone vaccinated from covid well yeah yeah that's that's one start at least but in terms of actually production and editing there's a lot where they can change i would say just film a domestic season where there's 20 episodes and 14 or 15 teams. And a potential start line elimination and potentially five legs in the same area of the country. 
What could possibly go wrong? Where no one lives. Yeah, when no one lives and where the host is known to be not the nicest person in the world. No. So where do you guys think Major Race 32 went wrong? Where do we begin? Yeah, pretty much. I was watching it the other day. Like, I was just uh, going through it pretty quickly just for this. Because, you know, trying to keep up with it, it wasn't worth it. And it was one of the... It's, wasn't the worst season ever, but it's one of those seasons where you keep waiting for it to get good and waiting for it to get good, and then all of a sudden they're in Berlin and you're like, it's not going to get good. Yeah, I'd say that's a pretty accurate thing because, unsurprisingly, I've been trolling the, the Reddit for the past sort of week to prepare for this podcast, and a lot of people are going, this is the worst season ever. I'm like, it's not the worst season ever, it's probably not bottom five for me, but it's an incredibly lazy season. Yeah, it was... It was... It's one of those seasons where they kept trying to make it more epic than it was, and it just came off feeling a little bit mediocre. Yeah, because the casting was, I think we would all agree, pretty good this season. It's yes. one of the best cast seasons for a long while. It's just everything else fell down, in my opinion. And a lot of that, I've actually had this note for like six weeks now, is the predictability angle. I did bring this up in the recaps, I think, is the fact that thanks to the Alliance forming, Every episode was kind of a foregone conclusion even before it had started. You knew that the Alliance was going to dominate an episode. You knew that someone outside of the Alliance was going to go home until there was literally no one else. But editing contributed to that and went, we're not actually going to edit this in a competent way to then make it a palatable season. Even though the Alliance isn't a bad thing, it sucked the life out of the season and editors were like, I don't know what to do with this. Uh, It's like... Even other shows that have alliances, like you think back to the first season of Survivor, they focused on the alliance, sure, but they also gave Pagong, you know, a fair bit of airtime so he could develop the characters and then, you know, feel bad when they got eliminated. This, you know, we didn't care that Ishwa and Apano went home. They were there for, what, 10 legs? Well, yeah, depends, depends, how you, depends how you count the legs. 10, 10 episodes. episodes. <laughs> Can we compromise at that, at least? <laughs> to stop this becoming an argument between me and Saunders again, we'll say 10 episodes rather than 10 legs. Fine. Given I don't know where you sit on this, I'm just going to assume you're wrong, so we'll go 10 episodes. <laughs> it's my default state of mind. How would you have fixed the Alliance issue? That's a good question. I I don't know. I think the one, th- the one thing they really need to do most is, like, at the moment, they ha- they clearly have the rule that you can't help the person who's doing the roadblock. But if, if they're going to have a rule that, say, you know, I'm sitting out and I can't help you, you know, do a slide puzzle or whatever, then they need to have a rule that the other people doing the puzzle can't help as well. Like, that doesn't seem to be too hard a rule to enforce. And yet they just won't do it. I think it's also production just not trusting races enough. I think because. So. They wanted to meddle so much in this season, and you could see them wanting to meddle with stuff like Phil's introduction to Manila, and they just didn't follow through. They just know what the rules are in terms of the game show laws, and just went, we're not touching it due to any sort of game show law, and not realising that they've done this sort of stuff before and stopped them meddling, and in fact did it in the Kazakhstan leg this season. They just didn't trust the racers to keep that up, and also themselves to go... We know what our parameters are here. We're just not going to work within them. But on the other hand, with the Alliance, it's not the racers' job to make good TV. And that's something you really have to bear in mind with a lot of these shows. The racers are well within their rights to go, we're going to just do our own thing. Fuck you, production. We don't care. It's production and editors' job to make it palatable television. Yeah, you essentially have a tweet from Elise Doganiri saying, I don't where somewhere people where one person tweeted to her, I hate alliances on The Amazing Race. I hate it when teams work together on tasks. And then she responds, I hate it when teams work together too. And you're thinking, you're, you're the cre- show one of the sh- two showrunners. You can put in rules in place. You have that power. You can't just say, oh, the contestants aren't playing properly because as long as that loophole is there, everyone's going to keep exploiting it, exploiting it with a million dollars on the line. Yeah, if you're on location and you know your parameters in which you can work... Do something about it rather than bitching about it afterwards. That's been my position on this for weeks, is the fact that when that tweet surfaced, because it surfaced about two weeks after she actually tweeted it, 
you should have done something at the time. You've had two years to think about this, and obviously you've had a revelation that maybe it impacted the season. Spoilers, it did. But at the time, especially in the Manila leg, you should have just sat them down and gone, you can't help each other. You absolutely are not allowed to help another team on this task. And if you do, you will get a penalty. I understand now why when Bertram got interviewed about 32, he had he did a lengthy interview about it, and then the interview asked him, oh, can you preview 32 for us without too many spoilers? And all he said was, we got really good footage from Kazakhstan, and we got really good footage during the Paris leg. <laughs> he did not mention about, oh, we have a really great cast, or it's real, it, each round is really exciting as to what happens. He just said, we got good footage in Kazakhstan and Paris, and he left it at that. And I also think that people don't necessarily mind alliances, as we've seen through Amazing Race history, there's a lot of very successful alliances. People don't mind alliances as long as they're not too successful. That's the distinction. People don't like the alliance this season because it was successful. People like to see alliances that fall apart. Hey Flo and Zach, do you remember helping Derek and True get to the pit stop in Vietnam instead of teams the team that was outside of your alliance? <laughs> this is what I mean. <laughs> That episode was so much better because of the fallout from the Alliance breaking up, rather than the Alliance absolutely steamrolling everyone and getting to the end together. Would removing the yield on every leg stop this? Did the the, the weekly yield force teams to align in a very in a very tight manner? I think the the U turn was probably more of a hindrance than the yield this season. The yield with the twist they had where it was, you know, 10 or 20 minutes, I, th I think they basically looked at Amazing Race 5 and then tried to saw the yield and liked it and then didn't realise why nobody used it. Like, nobody used it the first time because they didn't want, you know, revenge or whatever. And they didn't use it the first time. And then when they brought it back for Season 6, they got... You cut it down and then people started using it. And then this time when they decided to bring it back for 32, they were like, oh, well, we want people to use it. How do we do that? Well, we'll make the yield worth less time, which basically means it's even more pointless. I think it says it all that not a single U-turn or yield this season actually affected an elimination. No, the I don't think the yield ever, ever did when it was the first time around. Every single elimination this season was not due to a yield or a U-turn. Editors might have made it look like that, but none of them were. Everyone was far too far behind, even if they got yielded or U-turned. I think there was a very interesting point made by Witty Contribution on, um, on Reddit, basically asking, is there a distinction you can make between helping other teams at some tasks and not at others? So like helping them at physical ones, for example, uh, Chi helping at the cello task in Paraguay, rather than just literally giving people answers in Berlin at that roadblock. Or was it a detour? The roadblock, that was a roadblock. Yeah, but do production know it was a roadblock, or do they think it's still a detour? <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> we will get to that point fairly soon. Yay! <laughs> because I suspect Bindles has some things to say about that, I know Logan does. But yeah, I think it's maybe a good compromise if Amazing Race were ever to come back, for them to say... A physical task, you can give people advice, but you can't downright give them answers. Although, that's still not going to stop alliances. If production wants to stop alliances, they have to ban every single bit of help. I think it's more so just if it's it's different if they just ban it at the tasks themselves, because then, because that's what really made the difference, especially during the sauerkraut roadblock, because you could help with 100% of the task as opposed to, say, five to ten percent at a building task or or something that is a lot more physical and then because if you do that it, then alliances don't really make as much of a difference especially with how linear amazing race is now where a lot more of it comes down to what happens at the tasks rather than scrambling for flights or even trying to get from point a to point b within a city everything seems to be a lot linear now especially because most taxis do have access to GPS, so they don't really get lost as frequently, even though that still happened a couple times this season. It's not like what it was to take taxis on Amazing Race even 10 years ago, where certain countries, they would still be 
way behind on how to figure out how to get somewhere. Now it's, you don't really see people getting as lost. And I respond to somebody on Reddit too saying, why do people like the older seasons more than the newer seasons? Because the older seasons were good. Yeah, <laughs> you could say that. I, that I could have made the answer a lot shorter on Reddit. But any team who goes on the Mason race now has so much base. It's so easy to do, to get so much basic background knowledge on what not to do. You're not really going to see people forgetting their passports anymore. Uh, it's very tough to br- everything's so tight now. That's a lot tougher to break any rules or there's enough knowledge on what rules you on what rules not to break that everyone's going to have that very basic knowledge set. So now with the amazing race, the teams who succeed, it's not it's not a case of anybody can win amazing race anymore. It's anyone can win who has a very specific skill set since all of this basic knowledge has neutralized everyone else from having certain advantages. Oswald and Danny can't have a can't charm a local to show them everywhere to go. Uh, let's say Lynn and Carlin can't uh, excel anymore because there's not as many self drive legs. Just all of these sorts of things. For now, it's a very specific type of team or alliance of teams that are always going to do well under the current format. It's basically the Liam Neeson principle. They have a very specific set of skills that can make them very dangerous to someone like you. And the final thing, I think, in terms of where Amazing Race 32 went wrong is the throwing the cast members under the bus thing. And I know it's got on pretty much everyone's nerves in terms of the actual decent fan community. But for the love of God, why are production throwing everyone under the bus this season? I think they are genuinely trying to blame the teams for this season not being great, whereas actually it's their job to make the season great. Go back to what I said about it's not race's jobs to make good TV. It's production and editors' jobs to make it into good TV. I I don't even think the races were the weak part this season, because most of the teams were pretty good. There were were a couple of duds, to be fair. But there always are, aren't there? Yeah, there always are. Even a team like Riley and Madison, they they feel like in a better season, they could have been really good. Like, Riley and Madison could have been good, Ishwan Apana could have been good, Caitlin and Haley were good, Leo and Alana were good. Like, there were good teams here, and they just didn't get anything to work with. Yeah, and, and stuff like Riley and Madison could have been turned into such good villains. We had secret scenes of them being really villainous, and it all got cut because they were just trying to make the Alliance blandly competent. And then they said with Ishwar and Aparna that that's the edit that shocked the other cast members the most because Ishwar and Aparna have the reputation of being have having really big personalities when they're in a group together. Yeah, I mean, I would say Amazing Race 32 is the preview we have got most wrong in terms of some of our impressions of the races. Hung and Chi, we did not get any indication of Hung being so competitive. So glad we were wrong on that. So glad she called me out for being so wrong on that because they were brilliant. I mean, Ishwar and Abana, we got them so wrong because I had such a good vibe from them and we got nothing. They got so under-edited until their final leg. Their biggest edit was confronting Justin on the racer's recap. Yeah, and it's like, you have such good stuff to work with, and I would put money on them having such good stuff to work with in terms of these teams, and they just edited it so weirdly. I I have the feeling that the teams, especially James and Will after winning the whole thing, that they would have preferred if their season not to air at all. <laughs> I feel like they enjoyed their win when no one, when the general public didn't know about it yet. And that's not how a team who win and win in a pretty dominant fashion should ever feel, regardless of how you feel about James and Will. Personally, they were really good on the show in terms of being competent at tasks. They didn't really have much of a breakdown apart from Will's driving in Paris. And yet they shouldn't feel in their heart of hearts that they had a bad experience on Amazing Race just because production and editors are throwing them under the bus and trying to save their show at the expense of these teams. Yeah, James and Will had to deal with fan backlash where they genuinely had to try and call out fans for their discriminatory comments against them constantly and in fact even (laughs) confront some of the other recappers online. 
I mean, there is a small degree of irony in James having to confront people about podcasts and stuff, at least personally, but we defended them a lot this season anyway, not just because they defended us in, or James defended us in 28, but because they are actually pretty good TV themselves. And they thought about this show far more than pretty much every other team. It's just the actual show itself threw them under the bus. They were definitely my least favourite team this season, but they weren't a bad team. Now, like I said, you've got to kind of separate how you feel about them personally and how you feel about them actually in the context of the race, I think, with James and Will, more so than a lot of a lot of other teams. Because I know people have had run-ins with James especially, given his long history with ORGs and things. It's a very interesting example, I would say, James and Will, because I quite like them in the context of the race. I like them as people outside of the race as well. But the show really didn't do them any sort of justice. No, I, I think we're talking before about how um, about how the race feels a lot more superficial than it did yeah. in, in the early years. I think that sort of goes to partly that continues through to the casting because we've had, you know, if you think back to the early, early years and you think back to sort of, you know, the gay contestants, we had Tim Guido, uh, Oswald and Danny, Ken, Andrew, Riken and Chip, like all those sort of teams, they're all definitely gay, but they've also got like other stories going on as well, where Will and James and the other gay teams we've had in recent seasons kind of feel like they've been, either cast or edit to try and capitalise on the sort of people who end up on Drag Race? I would say casting has veered far more towards one word being a personality. Because you take Riley and Madison this season, Beards was their personality. Beards is not a personality, guys. And that's, that's what pissed off Ishwar and Aparna the most, is that one comment they said pre-season ended up being re-shown, I think, four or five times in the episodes. I think we and, called it out every time. <laughs> and they said, we only mentioned that pre-season. I, they probably don't even remember even mentioning it pre-season. <laughs> like, where did they get that sound clip from? <laughs> they, they, they filmed interviews at, after the end of each leg, and none of them were used. But it, it's like Leo and Alana. They even lampshaded it in the premiere of this season, basically distilling Leo and Alana down to nerds and they called it out at the Hollywood Bowl and then did the exact thing they were calling out of distilling these people down to nerds. Leo and Alana are not just nerds, they are athletes as well. And none of that really got shown. I don't even know if they're even are, are they even really supposed to be that nerdy? No. I mean Leo <laughs> went to Harvard, that's it. And then they did don't they do more artistic stuff? Yeah. Alana's a poet. <laughs> Yeah, none of them do programming and play a ton of video games and, I don't know, hang out on 4chan and stuff, right? <laughs> Not that we're aware of. Not that we're aware of. But it, it's just, it's relying on lazy stereotypes in terms of the casting. It worked this season, but it hasn't worked for a little while, I would say. No. When you're relying on lazy stereotypes and you're, you're planning the race around the tasks more than like how the relationships grow and develop and all that. It's like a perfect storm of suck. And talking of a perfect storm of suck, a topic we're going to move on to now that I know Bindles has a lot to say, where did it start going wrong? I actually have one of your notes as my first point here, by the way. <laughs> I would love to hear it because I have about three notes in total. <laughs> 21 days, 12 episodes. Yep. <laughs> Bindles and I were discussing a couple of weeks ago about basically the idea of this this entire podcast being where did Amazing Race start to go wrong? And Bindles sent me a lot of messages on this topic, but it all kind of boiled down to them being proud of filming 12 episodes in 21 days and not really experiencing the countries that they're going to. I, I was working it out the other day, 21 days, and once you take out you know, pit stops, flights, all that sort of stuff, you're basically left with winning a million dollars for about 10 and a half days' work. I mean, you know, not bad money if you can get it, but it's not great television. That's the thing. And the fact that they are so proud of this and turning it into the hashtag, it just isn't isn't something to be proud of, I would say. Look at the last few episodes of this season. 
because I wrote this on Reddit too, where everyone figured what the Manila, well, the Manila episode, you can get a re- really detailed track on how long each hmm. task took, but the Manila leg was what four hours? Is that the good four and a half hours? It was four and a half hours from landing to to Riley and Madison checking in, and. I think I'm the only person who actually worked out it was four and a half hours, by the way. Everyone knew what time the check-ins were, but I was the only one who went even further and worked out what flight they were on. And then the CM replay, they figured, took about five hours start to finish for everybody? Yeah, the the longest leg of this season was probably the Mega Leg by default, which is about six and a half. No, because Mega Leg wasn't the longest, because we had Par- the Paris Leg that went... Um, we have Paris, Paraguay, and Berlin, I think, all went longer than the Mega Leg. And what's funny is that uh, Reality Blurred, Andy Denhart just interviewed Elise and Bertram, and because I guess Andy Denhart was following some of the stuff we were saying a little bit. And he was like, by the way, you kind of have already done the Mega Leg before as a twist. Not kind of done it, you've done it exactly like it. And they said, oh no, this was different because we had to... We had an overlap where we switched off uh, production crews. I guess it was the lunch break that teams were alluding to in their exit interviews. And they said, no, no, we had to switch off production crew. And I'm thinking, it was only six and a half hours. I distinctly remember Masonry 17 when they had the Oman leg where Nat and Kat and Gary and Mallory were out on the course for a total of 16 or 17 hours in one day. Six and a half hours is the same length of time Michelle and Victoria were lost in their car in Paris. Yeah, you don't need to switch off pro- production crew for that day. I mean, we're going to get on to obviously them completely ignoring Amazing Race history. That is obviously one of my massive bugbears this season. But the fact that they are still, still, months later, trying to defend the the mega leg, ugh, and City Sprint as being new twists... It's nothing new. Yeah, do you see the part where, where they talked about the city sprint too? No. So they so then Andy Denhart said, "Well, you, but because I'm pretty convinced he was following our stuff." Where he said, "By the way, the city sprint wasn't uh wasn't really a new twist either. You've had other you've had other episodes where you don't do roadwalks or detours." And they said, "Oh, right, right, yeah, we've done we've done other. We that's typically for finales where we've had." No. <laughs> where we've had, I know, where we've had no roadblocks, knee tours, and want, and did a more scavenger hunt style. With the city sprint, it was all in on the scavenger hunt aspect and trying to make it a like a quick a quick leg. I'm thinking you can't just uh, you, you can't do that. You can't just change the definition of it. I would put money on you having done urban races for charity that were longer than this the city sprint. Actually, this yeah. Actually, the last one I did did take five hours, so it did take longer than the city sprint. I would put money on Michelle having done urban races in Sydney that were longer than the city sprint. Even the name makes it sound like an urban race that couldn't get the rights to the words "Amazing Race." It sounds like something where you'd see a knockoff "Amazing Race" logo in the same font, just legally different to the "Amazing Race." The worst part is that Manila is my second home. I know what you can do in Manila. It it sometimes takes you four hours just to go 10 kilometers. It takes you the length of a city sprint to get where you want to go in Manila. There's no way you can do a full, proper, amazing race leg in Manila in four and a half hours. Maybe add a one in front of the four, and then you probably have a proper length of a leg in Manila. So, Manib has contributed a lot to this section as well. I'm going to be sprinkling his points through uh, the rest of this podcast, but his first point on this is that the lack of mingling is where it went wrong from Amazing Race 13 onwards, obviously, with the did you push my sports bar off the ledge incident. And um, in fact, only on rare occasions like Thanksgiving and in the mine this season uh, were they actually allowed to interact outside of the confines of the leg. And it became a lot meaner by stopping the mingling and forcing teams to hate each other a bit more. Granted, that didn't really happen so much this season. It was more three teams who really liked each other and didn't really, I guess they didn't really have any time to get to know the other teams to where the alliance could be stopped. Like, I guess if you had more mingling, then maybe the three teams are thinking, hmm, maybe I want different allies heading into the end because I'm starting to like people outside of my alliance. 
more and more. Yeah, there's definitely two instances in this season where they actually allowed them to mingle. One was mid-leg thanks to the overnight rest period in the mine, and then the other one was Berlin with Thanksgiving. Right, because then that alliance was completely solidified from Berlin onwards. Yeah. Because Berlin, you still had Leo and Alana help out Ishwar and Aparna. And I think after that, you don't have any any alliances outside of the already formed alliances. And thanks to Logan's blog, I have another note here. The reduced budget is obviously a thing that we're going to have to bring up. However, as I've seen Mr. Saunders make this point quite a few times... Just because you have a reduced budget doesn't mean you can skimp on the production values. We cover far better shows on this podcast that do far more with far less. Yes, you do. And Amazing Race is pissing money up the wall with Big Spectacle without actually doing the basics of trying to make sure it's competently produced. I would happily not have had a task like the Berlin uh, Face First Repel and had something actually interesting and vaguely cultural for Berlin having been there. I think part of the problem is they're trying to build the tasks that don't quite feel, like, natural. Like, I don't mind, for example, the Paris leg. I don't mind, you know, doing a task about French art or whatever. But the tasks that they did kind of felt like, oh, well, we're just going to, you know, stop, let them play with these people in dress-ups for five minutes and then keep going. Like, there wasn't really a task there. And even that task, they ended up redoing it later in the season in India anyway. It was basically the same thing as the augmented reality roadblock. It feels like they're running on fumes a little bit and just yeah. resorting to spectacle. But it's not like they've had a reduced budget suddenly. The reduced budget started in Tar 12, and they've produced far better seasons with a limited budget. Does anyone know if there's been more drastic budget cuts since Tar Twelve? Like how much? Like it would be interesting to know exactly. I mean, we we know we all know that there has been a reduced budget after the original All Stars happened, but like has it been increments of it going further down and down? Like how small is this budget now compared to season twelve? I'd imagine it probably went up a little bit for fourteen, but I don't know after that. Yeah, I think the conventional wisdom is that it went down slightly after 18 again. Because they had a budget increase for 18 to turn everything to HD. Because Tar was the last kind of holdout on HD. So they had a, a yeah. bit of a budget increase for 18, not just because it was returning players and therefore higher prizes, but also because of the HD transition. And then I think it's pretty much stayed static since Tar 19. I don't know. Well, I mean, we did have the Friday night death slot start to happen around 25. Could, could the budget of, and then that's when they changed the rule of you can only, when you buy a ticket for your flight, you can't change it. That rule came into effect in 25, so I can't help but think that maybe 25 was the next time they took a big budget hit. And then 28 was all recruits. Uh, 29, it was trying to cast a bunch of individuals. And then 30, they went more, to, a lot, 30 was heavily recruited. 31, of course, was all recruits again, since it's just from the CBS pool. And then 32 is the first season, I guess, in quite a while where everyone had to be properly casted for it. <laughs> I think they like to trumpet the budget cuts as an excuse, rather than it just being them running out of ideas a little bit. You can even do legs on a small budget that feel better than the legs we're getting. Like you, th you think back to like the first couple of seasons, season one, they basically didn't have any real task sort of task until Beijing. Like pretty much everything before that is basically go here or, you know, search this landmark or, or like really simple stuff where basically the most expensive thing is getting the clue box there. That's actually the, that's, that comes to mind too, actually, because people, somebody was complaining, oh, well, fast forwards were lame anyway. Why do we have fast forwards anymore? It's like the fast forward wasn't about achieving a task originally. It was just going really far out of your way to a random scenic location, grab the clue, and then head to the pit stop. It wasn't about the task ever for the fast forward. I must admit, when I saw that response to your uh, your post on Reddit, I thought Logan is going to rage at this. <laughs> <laughs> but 
yeah, I, I feel like they're just going, oh, we've got a reduced budget, and then not thinking ahead to how they can actually make it competent. Because they don't have to go for records. They don't have to go for big spectacle. They have to go for competence, I would say. First and foremost, they have to start with actual competent production choices before they can even go for trying new countries, new twists, potentially. At least big spectacle new twists. And the final point I have to mention on this is going to be, I think all three of our berserk buttons, is rewriting and ignoring the show's history. Yes. We have already mentioned the two main bugbears from Amazing Race 32 with the uh, the City Sprint and the Mega Leg, both of which are nothing new. And as we said on the podcast at the time, a roadblock and detour free leg has been done twice in the previous four seasons to this one. It was a new twist when they did it in Chicago in 29. It's not a new twist when you do it for a third time in five seasons. But they seem to have a complete blind spot to this show ever existing before Amazing Race 14, with the exception of Colin and Christie. Everything else seems to have been rewritten now. Yes, Colin and Christie hated Oxen, and Uchen and Joyce, Uchen and Joyce got their heads shaved. And then maybe something from season one. That's all that ever gets acknowledged anymore from the first 13 seasons. Yeah, as much as obviously I have a lot of jokes at Vidim Renaissance's expense, that was at least a season where you could see they were trying to commemorate most of the show. And I don't necessarily begrudge them for ignoring the history, it's just doing it so blatantly and then getting really defensive afterwards going, oh no, this has never been done before, here's a vague loophole we can use. And it's like, no, no, it's exactly the same thing, just hold your hands up and go, we didn't check. It's a shame when you hear the rumors of, or not rumors, they told us, <laughs> the how Eric and how Eric said that him and Jeremy were supposed to be on 31 and then were cut at the last minute, or the Lynn's family were cut at the last minute for 31 as well. Yeah. So they're, tr- I don't know who it is that's deciding last minute to cut out these pre-season 14 people, but it's a shame that at the last minute they decide, ah, nah. As long, if they didn't get a fight with Ox, and we don't really care. You can tell that they only wanted Colin and Christy back, and they were just inviting all of the old school people back out of sheer necessity, just in case Colin and Christy said no. Didn't Colin and Christy give an interview where they basically said they approached the casting people about getting back on the show? Yeah, they approached the casting people, and it was literally just as they were about to finalise the cast for 31, I think, and then that changed everything. Because then, as we well know, there were quite a few old school teams that were then told thanks, but no thanks. And they were told thanks, but no thanks at the very last minute, too. Yeah. So, now onto the bit I think everyone's been waiting for, because there's three crotchety old bastards on Amazing Race. This is probably going to be the bit where everyone goes, no, you're wrong. How can production actually change it? And I'm going to lead on with something that kind of ties in with the um, the ignoring the show's history and that is doing their own research because for the love of god it has been my bugbear the past two seasons of so many facts and figures that they're spouting being utter utter horse shit i mean just for 31 and 32 alone we had the number zero being invented in india 316 teams switzerland the world's oldest democracy manila being the texting capital of the world the hyderabad departure times the recap for berlin messing up roadblocks and detours the double end leg rebrand, the city sprint being the same twist they've done twice in the previous four seasons, and many, many, many more things. They have a multi million dollar budget. It does, I don't think they have to pay somebody too much to just do very basic fact checking before they push out the previously on Amazing Race script. If someone like me, who has not been invested in this show since the end of Amazing Race 29, can do better research than a multi million dollar production team, there is something wrong with the multi-million dollar production team. That's what it boils down to, is the fact that we are not paid for this, and I'm doing better research than them. That shouldn't be on. I shouldn't be finding any sort of inaccuracy, especially when it comes to stuff like Switzerland. Switzerland took me maybe 10 seconds to research, if that. It's just not acceptable. Another big thing is that they got to start using more... they got to get into more new countries again. I just looked at, I looked up the stats. They've only, out of the past 18 episodes, there's only been 
one leg in a new country and I've got a feeling there's only been, I think, probably turned or turned out the cities in Trinidad and Tobago and then Hyderabad, India, I believe are the only two. Oh, no. And then I guess Bogota. So we've had, what, three three new cities out of the past 18 legs? No, Split was a new city as well. Oh, Split. Okay. So four, so four out of the last 18 legs have been in new cities for Amazing Race. And I think the Dutch leg was in a new part of Holland as well. Yeah, it was in Kampen, wasn't it? So yeah. five. Five. Yeah. This is turning into a what did the Romans do for a situation. <laughs> Thank you, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> And then yeah, five cities, and then all, and then only one of them is even was even in a new country. I, I don't mind if they go back to the same countries, just as long as they're not doing it every season, like they've been doing with you know France and Germany and the Netherlands and the UK at the moment. Like, I I don't mind if they go back to you know countries in Eastern Europe that they haven't been to for ages and ages and ages, because we haven't seen that for a while. But by the fourth or fifth time they're in Berlin, it gets boring. I think in the interview that Bertram did about Amazing Race 33, there was no new countries in that either. No, he said, because, well, this isn't spoiler since Bertram has said it himself publicly. He said, what was it, London for the first leg? It was London, Glasgow, then they're in the Arctic Circle in Sweden before it got cancelled. Yeah. The only, I mean, the Arctic Circle in Sweden would be a new city, but definitely not a new country since they've been to Sweden a bunch of times already. Would it, though? Because didn't Amazing Race 17 go to the Arctic Circle in Sweden? I think it did. It was Norway, then they crossed the border. No, they did Sweden because the pit stop was the Norwegian border. Oh. And then the next leg was Norway. Right, so that wouldn't even be new. And then, because I was thinking about 2023 when they went to the Arctic Circle in Norway. But yeah, I forgot that 17 to the Arctic Circle in Sweden. Okay, so, so none of those are even new... Like Glasgow would be the new city, but that's in a very, very Anglophone country. <laughs> it's also Glasgow. Yeah, I was going to say, do you know what Glasgow is famous for? Glasgow is famous for having a lower life expectancy in some places than some African countries. There is a a bit of Glasgow, which I think the life expectancy at one point was 31, both due to malnourishment and gang violence. Interesting. And that is only about ten years ago, by the way. That that is a pretty recent um a pretty recent thing. I think they have slightly got it back up now, but not by much. And then the rest of the locations Bertram said in the interview was so we got country we got calls from Austria, New Zealand, and Vietnam, I think, for the other three countries he mentioned. He just mentioned all countries are thinking all those places have been visited many times now and aren't very big geographically. <laughs> so I don't think they're going to a new area in any of those places. Even if they do insist on going back to the, you know, going back to Paris and Berlin and Tokyo or whatever again and again and again, that wouldn't be such an issue if they kept doing more inventive tasks. But like this season we had that stupid chicken song in Berlin and I, I feel like singing is sort of the thing you do, you make the teams do when you don't have any idea of what else is left to do a little bit. And it, it wouldn't be so bad if it was something they did sort of, you know, every so often around the world. But I was thinking about it the other day and we had karaoke in Vietnam last season and I, there was the song in Africa in Zimbabwe. But aside from that, we've basically had four singing tasks and they've all been in German, in German-speaking countries. And I, I feel like you could make a singing task entertaining, but this isn't the way to do it. If you're doing it, you know, the same place, the same sort of song over and over and over. Yeah, because we've had uh, the yodeling speed bump in 20 in Austria. Uh, we had 26s. Serenade, we had the Yodeling Speed Bump, we've had the Vienna Boys Choir, and we've had the German Chicken Song this season. You could even go back to season nine where they had to smash the bottles while the music was playing in the background. Hmm. Maybe that could have been used in the city sprint, and then Gary and D'Angelo would be yelled at for not remembering that that aired for two seconds in season nine. 
But yeah, I wouldn't hate them going back to the same countries again. It's more about competent production for me. They need to get the basics in place before they even try and go for records. It's so infuriating covering this show, which is partially why 32 is the end of Amazing Race coverage for me, because I just cannot sit through them half arsing things anymore. One thing I thought about a few days ago that I haven't really seen mentioned anywhere, so I'm the first to think of this. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, Go you. Was that there that, that this was the first season to not use any no express like you think this should have been a good season because there wasn't any express passes, uh, there wasn't any pointless partner swapping, there wasn't any fast forwards, and there wasn't there wasn't any single U turns this season either, right? No single U-turns? No, no, it was eight single yields and two U-turns, I think. Then there was no head-to-head and there was no must-vote U-turn. Like, in terms of getting rid of excessive twists, the 32 had the least amount of twists in a very, very long time. I don't know that I would say a season that had the return of the yield a to-be-continued leg with an elimination, a mega leg, a city sprint. I don't know that that, I would count that as having less twists. But it wasn't, would would the city sprint really be, is that really a twist? Would the Mega Leg really be a twist? Well, the producer certainly seems to think it is. <laughs> would the Would the Mega Leg really be a twist when it's a miniature version of something they've done many times before over the years? When it really just end up being like any other leg? It seemed like it's just really the very first episode having a keep on racing leg like being elimination, and then having the weekly yield. I mean, real. I mean, was there really anything else major that happened this season? Seven single yields and two U-turns. It was. Yeah. So I guess if you include those, then yes, it would be more than other seasons. But there is a lot of regular twists, or even twists that were used at least for a couple seasons, that were all absent from this season. Yeah, I think you mentioned it in your blog when you said that they've basically abandoned every twist they've done for the past two seasons, but then replaced it with old twists just slightly changed or rebranded. Because we yeah. we didn't have any express passes, thank God. That's one positive I can say for this season. We didn't have any head-to-heads, thank God, because they ruined them. We didn't have the partner swap from 30, but instead we got the yield back, arguably with a good twist on it. I quite like that yield twist. We got the double length leg back rebranded, and we got the no roadblock, no detail leg rebranded. But I think also what it boils down to, especially with Amazing Race 32, but it's been kind of a downward slope for the past few seasons, is I don't think the production trusts the racers enough anymore. They don't trust them to do the self-drive legs as much. We arguably had kind of one and a half this season. But they don't trust them to do all that. They don't trust them to be able to book their own flights either as a cost-cutting measure or just genuinely because they only have deals with certain airlines and things. They don't trust them to do any of their own navigation, really. It's basically just... It's one step away from basically having someone in front of them with an umbrella leading them to another task. It's one of the third self-drive legs, if you're Will and James. That's another way that they buried the teams this season, is that everyone thought, oh, Will and James should have gotten a penalty because they didn't self-drive to next location, because... They didn't air the fact that it was the second car that Will and James broke down and it was the first situation ever. It could have been a record. It could have been a record where they could have said, hey, this is the first time ever where all of the replacement cars have broken down. So now it's up to the team to either try and fix the car or they move on foot to the next location. Because I guess that rule has probably been there forever, but production's always had enough backup cars. I mean, speaking of Eastern Europe, you go back to the Hungry Leg where everybody was breaking down a car and there were so many replacement cars used. This this season, Will and James break down just the one backup car and that's it. Apparently there was no other replacement car, so maybe production on a self-drive leg only has gets enough budget or only 
decides to use enough of its budget for one or two replacement cars for the whole cast in a self-drive leg, that's not good. That's probably a reason why they're maybe maybe for thirty three they think that situation was a big headache and maybe we don't have self drive legs anymore after thirty two. I don't want this episode to feel like we're basically ignoring all of the issues that they've had, like the reduced budget, the fact that Ford backed out. Thanks, Bergen. All that sort of stuff. I don't want it to feel like we're deliberately ignoring those just to bag on the production of this season. But the problem we have is the fact that all of these have been used as excuses, and we all know full well that there are other shows that do this sort of stuff far better with far smaller budgets. And I don't think it's an excuse as much as they are trying to make it. Even if they don't have the budget to, you know, rent 10 cars and park them in, you know, Manaus or wherever, the legs are so close, closely packed together now that you probably could every now and then make them walk to the next destination and just make them like navigate through the streets. Like that would be an easy way to get the navigation back at basically no cost, really. Or alternatively, given that we had Paris and Germany as both having a self-drive element, make them drive from Paris to Germany. Yeah. Make them keep those cars. They were pretty much brand new cars. The roads between Paris and Berlin should be fairly good. It will take them roughly the same amount of time that it took them on the train. They genuinely could have done that. They just didn't want to do that. And it would have easily made that leg more interesting because everyone would have been a bit more spread out. Because I would put money on the fact that there are some of those teams who 100% would have struggled on the German autobahns, and we didn't see that. I miss when teams got lost. That's the thing. They don't even allow teams to get lost anymore, really. Yeah, even this season, the big highlight of what was the best episode of the season? Oh, it was the Paris leg because Michelle and because of the huge upset and we had multiple teams get lost throughout the leg and then one team blew a huge lead for like seven hours and somehow Kaylin and Haley survived. That was the peak of the season. It was also the only episode this season where anything happened. Yeah, that too. And then everything was super, pretty much as soon as you got to sauerkraut, you could argue the season just really, really went downhill from there. And and in, in terms of the tasks too, I'm gonna I'm thinking, say fast forward a year from now when this season is gonna be viewed as ancient, what 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 are the big moments from the season? What are the big tasks from the season, or even the past couple seasons? Is it gonna be like what stands out as a task from season thirty two? I don't think anything is gonna stand out. It's just gonna be remember the alliance. <laughs> no, I, I was trying to count the years before when Michael was looking it up and I completely forgot the Cambodia leak even happened. It was that unmemorable. Yeah. There there was a yield in every leg apart from the first one, Manaus and um, Cambodia. And then obviously Manila and and the finale didn't have one. And then there were two in the the double end leg. So it's seven. I just think that this season, either by design or by accident, is so utterly unmemorable. I don't think anyone is really going to remember anyone outside of the Alliance, and that is absolutely criminal when you consider that we have teams like Michelle and Victoria, Leo and Alana, and Kaylin and Haley all outside of the Alliance. And they're the favourites of the cast. Yeah. <laughs> and they are all lovely people. And arguably we did get a bit of grief from Michelle and Victoria for saying they would go out first, but I still feel like they probably wouldn't stab me if I charm them enough. If you charm them enough. I actually genuinely would quite like to meet those three teams. And yet, I'm not sure I can say that about a lot of previous teams we've had, at least in the past couple of years. And yet, those teams are going to be completely and utterly forgotten in the annals of Amazing Race history, purely because the Alliance was so kind of suffocating on the season. But I don't think it actually was on site. That's the thing. I think there's a lot of stuff on the cutting room floor that they probably should have included, if for no other reason than to distract from the Alliance. Well, they should have included D'Angelo's scene with the final three teams at the finish line instead of making it a deleted scene. Because that was definitely the most interesting piece of footage I saw from the whole finale was D'Angelo saying, was it was it nice to lose, guys? Was it nice to lose and follow through with that Alliance? That's something I want to see. That's way better than Kale and 
Brandy yelling at, even yelling at uh, Brent and Katie at the finish line of 16. But I think it all boils down to the fact that we basically shouldn't be able to feel the heavy hands of the editors on a season or on an episode. And it feels like they edited each episode separately, not knowing the storylines of any other episode. And it just kind of came together as a weird mishmash, odd season. I don't think production even really considered like how the task within an episode went together that well. Like, I had to keep going back to Germany, but like that leg, you basically started off at the Berlin Wall with a replica of a World War II era suitcase. Then you ended up in a crappy vehicle that kept breaking down. And then you end up trapped in a little box that's filling with smoke. Like, that would be bad enough at the best of times, but in Germany? <laughs> I just, whenever you mention Berlin, I think back to the, the Facebook message you sent me when the episode had aired, just going, Jesus Christ, they are trying to kill these people. Yeah. No, they are, because that would have been entertaining. <laughs> I just I remember your your message when you were just describing the teledisco as trying to suffocate people in a small box in Germany. Yep. And then people theorize that the reason why the mega leg happened is because somebody stole the pit stop mat in Germany and they were one pit stop mat short for the two India episodes. So they that's why they had to combine it into a mega leg because they only had one mat to use. But yeah, I think the production and editing of this season just felt very disparate. It felt very disjointed. It felt like nobody was talking to each other in production or the editing suite. And it just kind of came together as, as this Frankenstein's monster of a season. I, I wonder if, like from an editing perspective, it might work better if they went back to having the non-eliminations in the back half of the race. Like, it, it's not necessarily the most exciting. But if you can feel the race getting more and more dramatic in the early parts of the race, then you can afford to have a non-elimination later on. But at the at the moment where you've got them at the start, then you're basically dragging, you know, too many teams for too long and you don't get to really know any of them that well. It also would allow them to spend a bit more on the latter half of the season because yeah. there'd be less flights and that sort of stuff. Yeah. Arguably with Amazing Race 32, we would have lost people's princesses, Kaylin and Haley, far too early. But in return for that we would have probably got... Screen time for Ishwar and Aparna? Yeah, we would have probably got Ishwar and Aparna realising that they were out of the Alliance way earlier than they did. We would have definitely got Gary and Dianzo realising that they were out of the Alliance way earlier than they did. And there would have actually been drama in the season. Yeah. So that's not a bad suggestion, for once. Like, I, I get why... <laughs> Shut up, Michael. <laughs> I get why they don't want non elimination at final three, but I, th I think you can afford to do that if the leg is good. Like the non elimination at final three in Amazing Race 3, that is one of the best legs ever. And then you look at, you know, season four where it's, you know, cans and it's, you know, right in a car or whatever it was. I don't even remember what the tasks were of that leg. That was that boring. <laughs> it's Australia. There's never any good Australia legs. No, there isn't. Same way there's never any good uh, UK legs. No. Yeah, I think basically, as much as obviously we love drama on, on the podcast and sort of in our wider reaches, we are advocating for a little bit more drama in these seasons. Maybe not to the extent of racers, fans deliberately misleading other teams in the final three to then make sure that their favourites win, but we just need a little bit of a, a spark in these sort of shows. It was very flat deliberately on the part of the editors by the look of things, because they cut out so much of the drama of the season. It was deliberately flat. They just, they forgot how to edit a season, I think. I think one of the big problems with this season was every leg sort of felt like it was leg two a little bit, where, like where you're still trying to get to know people, but there's too many people and you don't really care. It was the, the resetting point, because Maneeb actually pointed out the constant equalising in this season, and it was far more evident this season than it is normally. But nobody was allowed to get ahead of each other enough, which obviously helped the Alliance a lot. But it felt like there was a constant reset with a fresh pair of eyes looking at each episode and cutting it and producing it. And there's just no, no proper through line in the episodes, apart from the existence of this Alliance and then it getting stronger and stronger as the legs go on. Not to mention every single 
every time they did fly, it was just to the next big city. They never went to a smaller town and other than say the turn down Tobago like they didn't go to any small towns this whole season. It was all around Paris, all around well certain areas of Berlin. Uh, when they went to Kazakhstan, they were just stuck in Almaty, Almaty the whole time. Maybe the outskirts of town a little bit, but not really like, say, go to a smaller town that's a two-hour drive away. They all stuck to these major cities for flying. The most rural we got was that camp where they did the yurts and then went immediately back. Yeah, like they only went, like say, 10 minutes outside of the of the town. Same with Paris, too. They get slightly outside of Paris to that castle, and then boom, you're right back into Paris again. You look at a lot of other seasons of Amazing Rapes, not just the early seasons, but even more, more recent ones where, hey, they do, they do take them to some of the smaller towns that can be several hours away, and then they go back. Not just, oh, we're only going to stick to... Because they did use a new country, I guess, for every... for almost every episode this season to where it's like, oh, they flew into Manila, but I'm thinking, Manila's not a very... If you think about all the different places in the Philippines, like, say, the say whenever Michael McKay for Active TV, when he does an episode of the Amazing Race for one of the other versions in the Philippines, he typically only does one or two tasks or a couple tasks, and then he goes outside of Manila, and that's it. Because there are so many other places to go to. Here with Amazing Race, all they did was the city sprints, not even just Manila, but in a very small section of Manila, and that was it. And that happened with, say, Hyderabad, India, where they didn't really go. They could have gone to another city for the second half of the Mega Leg, but no, it was all within Hyderabad. And given that cities in India are very big and very tough to get through, and the fact they got through two roadblocks and two detours and a pit stop all in the span of six to eight hours means they're they're not really exploring it's just all stuck in the same city every single time (laughs) hyderabad was a bit weird because like it was the only time this season where they were where they had two legs in the same place really and yet i don't feel like i learned anything new about india really like basically the first leg was pretty much India has computers now. Yay. And then the second leg was colonialism is great. Yay. <laughs> and I'm like, is that really how you want to showcase India in 2020? I don't know. Like contrast is like, cause they've done two episodes back to back in India tons of times before you think back to 27 yeah. where it was very distinct. They had a day leg in India, and then they did a night leg, which had very di- a very different atmosphere. Or you could even go back go back to say uh, season four. Those were two very very distinct episodes in India. Here with Hyderabad, the, the two episodes. <laughs> I don't think there's there's really much distinction between them, and could have looks like it could have taken place in almost any city in India, really. Yeah, I I don't mind if they have two legs in the same country or in two places that are very close to each other, but having them so close together, like it basically brought the season to a stop and there was no momentum from then on out. And that's been an issue sort of ever since they started doing two legs in the same city all the time. But you can, I think you can do it really well. Like it's not, a great example but the budapest legs in season six where you had sort of like you know medieval castles in the first leg and then you had you know modern hungary with the soup and the water polo and all that sort of stuff in the second leg they're very distinct legs but it still feels like things are happening and i I think they've sort of fallen into a rut where they keep using the same sort of places over and over and doing the same sort of things over and over. Like I brought up the sinning tasks in Germany and Austria before, but I don't think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think they've ever had two legs in a row in Germany or the Netherlands, which very similar countries that basically, you know, trade on and off which one turns up in a season, but it's always only ever one leg. I don't think they've ever done two in those countries. And, and you, you know, you'd think for countries that turn up that often that they would be able to do it. Like, 
I don't think it, it would be too hard to do two legs in the Netherlands or two legs in Germany or two legs in Portugal or any of like, there are countries that I feel like would be really good places to do two legs. I don't know that the countries that get two legs are the right places at the moment. I wish they would do two legs in a country that hasn't been visited yet. (laughs) So have you guys got anything else you want to say about the Viking funeral of Amazing Race? Before we, no. before we set it out to to see and fire the flaming arrow. Uh, who the hell knows when they'll even reveal the film thirty three? <laughs> who the hell knows whether they will a listen to this and b actually care? Those are the bigger concerns, I guess. Yeah. So, thank you guys for uh, ruining your Christmases by uh, actually thinking about Amazing Race again. And thank you all for listening to this special episode. We're officially done with Amazing Race Recaps now. Don't forget you can contact us on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, or Instagram, where we are, RTV Warriors. Or you can email us and contact us at rtvwarriors.com. Logan is on Twitter at Logsuperquacky. Bindles is the Grim Recapper. And I am MJ Helmstone. Logan and I, as I mentioned earlier, will also be back on January 6th to start the Easter Mall 2021. Thank you for listening. We'll see you soon. And we'll also be back to do Amazing Race Australia 5. No, no, we won't. <laughs> <laughs> All right, peace out and just chill till the next episode. See you later. When the farmer feels their seaweed has been properly laid out to dry, he may give them a little face cream. Oh, oh thank you. Oh. oh, yes, thank you. Oh, you got to really squeeze it. Yeah, just squeeze it. You got to get right in there and just milk the teat. I'm just grabbing things, just boom, milk, milk, milk. And it was just a weird sensation. Have you whipped it by hand? My God, it takes forever. And your arm is burning. It's like, I gotta stop. (laughs) Muy bueno. Sexy. No? I like them on my face.